previously on the Fallen. Sir, we need to talk. I've just heard something disturbing. Something about a wall on the border. What the hell is going on? You are on a need to know basis. Quite frankly, you do not need to know. Look, in the short time since leaving that apartment, I've seen shit I thought only possible in movies. If it's not zombies, then what the hell is it? They're dead. Nothing's going to change that. When the First Minister left Hollywood, she left with a hard drive containing the information. I need that information. He snorted at the thought and took another drag, walking over to the group who had gathered at the gate, waiting to face the horrors that lay in wait beyond the safety of the gate of Atlantis, the city in the middle of a sea of shit. The group gathered at the gate, waiting for further instructions before venturing out into the darkness of the park, into the unknown. Abbott reached the group and went over to Beth and tapped her on the elbow and nodded as she removed the cigarette from her pocket and handed it to him. He put it behind his ear and they began to speak amongst one another. As they spoke, he kept his eyes on Pete and Danny who were huddled away from the group and seemed to be in a deep conversation. Pete was holding Danny's arm, staring into her eyes intensely. Listen, Danny, I just wanted to say, you do not have to do this. You know, you can stay here. No, I'm going with you. Cal is fine. He's at the crash and he has school anyway. All I would be doing here is worrying about you. So I might as well come with you so I can make sure you're safe. That's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. You must listen to everything I say out there. I am in charge, no matter what happens. You do as I say. I can't have... I can't have anything happen to you. It won't. I will be fine. Danny, I'm being serious. You're too important to me. Um, you know, to the community. To, uh... Cal, to have something happen to you. I know what you're trying to say. And you're important to me, too. Trust me. I will (coughs) listen to you. (coughs) Am I uh, interrupting something? Boss, I think it's time you address the troops. They're uh, getting a bit antsy. Yeah, right. Let's do this. The cold October wind and rain whipped around the team as they gathered at the gate, waiting for the captain to address them, to inform them of what they were doing. Pete stood in front of the gate, his rifle in his hands, and like a general, dressing his army before a battle. Right, spoke. ladies and gentlemen, our scouts have brought back reports that they have found three areas of interest on their survey of the Deadlands. These areas are said to contain supplies which will be a benefit for the community, and it's our mission to retrieve them and bring them back. A simple snatch-and-grab operation. Well... It's not going to be easy, is it? Not with that attitude, Harper, no. I think what Harper is trying to say... Don't call me Harper. ...is that nothing is easy in life anymore. It's not just as simple as going in and grabbing the supplies. It's not like the old days. Abbott, mate, no one wants to hear about how they did things back in the 1920s. (laughs) (laughs) Shit, you little shit. Abbott, pay attention, this is important. I don't need to be told how to kill. I've been doing that since before you even had nappies. Abbott, stop being such a dick. Just listen. Everyone must stay in formation unless instructed otherwise. If we happen to come across any survivors, we help them the best we can, and if they want to come, then we take them back to Atlantis, but assess the situation first. Our first objective is to get those supplies. I'll be splitting you into pairs, and your partner is who you will stay with. Okay, so, Stephen and Roach, you'll make up Alpha. Beth and Abbott, you're Bravo. And Danny and I are Charlie. <laughs> of course you two will be together. Abbott, shut up and listen. I will tear that ginger scruff off your fucking face if you speak to me like that again. Abbott, wind your fucking neck in and pay attention. Jesus Christ, you know it's like speaking to a child with you sometimes. You wouldn't think you're pushing OAP. <sighs> Before weapons check, what is the rule of the crows? Let, Let no, no one turn. turn. Right, any questions or can we get going? Where are the supplies? And what are they? Do we know? So, the supplies are at different locations. The closest one is in the train station where we'll head to first, and then we can decide where to go from there. The second one is up on the Royal Mile, outside St Giles. Finally, there's a medical supply tent up at Greyfriars Kirk. They found supplies up there, but the old town is teeming with the dead, so we must be careful when we head up there. So, what about infected? Are we expecting any? Yeah, so the report doesn't state that the areas are overrun, but I think we should expect to see a fair few. So, everyone just please be on your guard. You ready? 
As I'll ever be. Weapons check. Pete cocked his rifle, and the rest did the same, and the six of them left the safety of the compound into the darkness of a desolate Edinburgh. The wet grass sloshed and squelched underneath their feet as they ran through the gardens, their wet footsteps the only sound audible through the rain. It had been relentless, for over an hour getting heavier showing no signs of stopping. Each person had a pistol equipped and a torch attached to their vests, the beams of light breaking the darkness illuminating the large raindrops that fell in front of them. They were ready for any contact with the dead. Eventually they reached the stone steps that led to the Waverley Bridge, water cascading down like a thick, fast waterfall creating a deep muddy puddle at the bottom. Wooden planks had been placed over the wrought iron gate leading to street level. Roach was the first one to approach, removing a drill from his hold all and attached it to his back. It will take a moment to get these off. You guys, cover me. Just don't take too long. He looked around to see if the rest of the team were there and was surrounded by Pete, Stevenson, Danny, Harper and Abbott. They stood with their backs to him, pistols at the ready. He took a deep breath, water pouring down his face, dripping off his beard. As quick as he could, he inserted the bolt into the screw and pulled the trigger, and the drill whirled to life, pulling the screw out of the board. The sound of the drill was deafened by the rain, but still had Roach on edge. Eventually, the board started to loosen. As Roach worked on removing the wooden blockade, the rest of the team heard movement to the right, twigs snapping and shuffling of leaves. As they pointed their pistols towards the bush, Suddenly, through the shadows, three figures emerged, their arms outstretched, clawing at the air. Some of the twigs were catching onto their skin, tearing away at the flesh, with blood gushing out. Their faces were torn, and muscle was hanging down on their cheeks. A woman who wore a shredded denim dress, the top of which was torn, and her lungs were hanging out of her chest. Her hair was matted with blood, dirt and gunk as she lunged towards Abbott, jaw snapping at the air black teeth hoping to latch onto a piece of flesh. Abbott struggled against the onslaught from the rotting woman and was eventually able to reach for his knife, removing it from his holster on his waist, plunging it deep into the top of her head. A fountain of blood burst into the air. Danny removed her bat and swung it to an older man who wore a blue boiler suit, whose throat had been ripped out, his chest was stained crimson with dry blood and bits of meat hung from the fabric. The wood collided with his skull, smashing it like a rotten pumpkin. Blood and brain matter splashed over the grass as his body fell in a heap. Hurry up, you big oaf! The last infected, a police officer, grabbed Harper by the shoulders and tried to sink his rotten teeth into her jugular, blackened nails clawing at her face as she struggled to get the man off of her. She pushed at him as her hands fell through his rotting neck as decaying flesh coming off in her fatigues. Stevenson grabbed him by the hair, pulling him off. As he pulled, the man's scalp started to come off with his hands, making a loud squelch as the rotten meat pulled from the bone. Stevenson dropped the wet meat and plunged his knife through the hard bone of the man's now visible skull. Blood and brain juice sprayed out all over his hands. He threw the body onto the wet grass with a thud and wiped his hand on his vest. Thanks. That was a close one. Hey, don't even mention it. A few seconds later, Roach whistled to tell the rest of the group that the boards were off and they could go upstairs. With pistols drawn, they crept up to be met with complete devastation. Well, fuck. Cars and tour buses and bodies lay burnt on the ground. The stench of death was palpable, clinging to their nostrils like a leech. They looked to their right and saw that half the road had been destroyed and caved into the earth like a sinkhole. Cars hung on to the edge of the hole, threatening to fall in at any opportunity. To their left, cars littered Princess Street and shop windows were smashed. Five or six zombies shuffled through the debris, aimlessly wandering, looking for their next meal, bumping into burnt cars. A tram had overturned and was blocking the road. Splatters of crimson fluid covered the roof and the road. This is a setback, but nothing we can't handle. We stick to the plan. That hole? What caused that? That is probably where the helicopter crashed into the station. Sucks to be that guy. They weaved their way through the shells of traffic, making sure not to catch themselves on any bits of metal that were sticking out. There were still bodies sitting in the cars, still wearing their seatbelts, their burnt carcasses revealing an untold pain. 
Abbott sidled past the car, slowly avoiding the broken glass, when suddenly a burnt zombie lunged for him through the window, being held back by a seatbelt. He jumped out of the way, bumping into Roach, who turned around with a grunt. Hey, what's where you're going, Grandad? Yeah, shut up. One of those fuckers tried to grab me. We're coming up on the station. Shut it. Looks like it's taken a lot of damage from that helicopter. So watch yourself down there. We don't know what to expect. The team slowly walked down the ramp leading to the station. The closer they got to the entrance, the stronger the smell of rotting flesh and stale feces got. With every step, the stench got stronger. As they crept, their footsteps light on the wet tarmac. They suddenly saw the extent of what they would have to deal with. Lights flickered in the station, plunging them into darkness every few seconds, but there was enough light to see the army of zombies shuffling around the now derelict station. Men and women at all different stages of decomposition bumped into one another in a vain attempt to find a way out. Danny looked on in horror as she saw police officers, nurses, station workers, firemen, paramedics, all varying injuries, chomping at the air. Fuck. What do we do? What do we do? Uh, We'll turn back and find another way in. A helicopter had crashed through the road into the station and had obviously exploded, causing everything in the vicinity to be destroyed, including the newsagent. The marble floor from what she could see through the mass of shuffling corpses was smashed, an opening revealing a tunnel where the scabies seemed to be coming from. The newsagent was completely destroyed, just rubble stood in its place. The carcass of the helicopter lay with its nose in the marble and its tail pointing towards them, the newly opened hole in the ceiling. Fire bellowed from the cockpit and the charred remains of what she assumed to be the pilot lay in the ground next to it, clawing at the air, unable to move. Holy crap! Looks like we can't get the supplies now. Well, it looks that way, sweetheart. What now? We go back and wait till morning so we can have a better view. We can't leave that many infected this close to Atlantis. It's too dangerous. Harper's right, it's way too dangerous. They don't seem to have noticed yet, so we got time. One shot. And those things will be on us before you can say, Ah, I, the new. <sighs> Shit. You're right. Far too many to take out by hand. Could we try to block off the entrance, stop them from coming yeah, out? It'll make too much noise moving something into play. What then? What are we supposed to do? I have an idea. If we split oh, off... fuck that. Hear me out, Harvey. Stop <laughs> calling me Harvey. We can come at them from different angles. Whittle them down from opposite sides. Stevenson, that's not a bad idea. Right, Alpha, you head through the shopping centre. Bravo, go to the hole to see if there's a way down. Danny and I will stay here and wait for you guys to get into position and I guess we'll go from there. Okay, move out. The team split up and they went their respective ways. Roach and Stevenson went towards Waverley Shopping Centre. As Harper and Abbott went towards the hole, Pete and Danny stayed crouched behind a burnt out car. Stevenson reached the door first with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and one behind his ear. He pushed the doors, but it didn't move. He peered through the glass to see if he could see anything. Nothing. The shopping centre seemed to be empty, safe from the dead bodies and the floor and the streaks of blood smeared on the marble. He tried to push against the door, but it wouldn't budge. He peered through the glass again and saw a thick chain was wrapped around the handle, preventing anyone from coming in or leaving. Hi, big boy. Get out with your door, eh? What? You're not strong enough? You need a real man to open it for you. Shut your cake hole and open your door. Roach kicked the glass panel on the door with a heavy boot. Why, well, you're not strong enough there, wee lad. Shut it. Stand back. After three kicks, the glass buckled and smashed on the ground, the sound rippling through the shopping centre. All right, if you want to cheat, I suppose. The rain was falling so hard that the pair failed to hear the loud groans that emanated from within. The groans that got louder with the sound of smashing glass. Roach stepped in first, and the wall of stench hit him like a freight train. The putrid odour of rotting meat, body odour and faeces filled the air, causing him to recoil and cover his nose. Stevenson followed, reacting the same to the horrendous smell. Silently, they walked along the corridor, boarded up shops lined the walls, their shutters pulled down tightly, preventing anyone from entering. 
as they eventually reached the main concord of the shopping centre, looked over the glass barrier down onto the sea of moving bodies. The noise was immense as the groans from the dead reached their ears. It was deafening. As they stared at the army of the dead below their feet behind them, they heard a click and a voice, low and whispered, filled their ears. Don't move. Throw your guns on the ground and kick them over to me. Hands on your head and turn around. Slowly! Tell me why you're here. Roach and Stevenson turned around slowly, dropping their rifles and pistols, kicking them away. They were face to face with a group of people dressed in shabby leather and denim jackets, torn jeans and large leather boots. The man who spoke was holding a pistol at them, and the rest had metal poles, chains and knives. Calm yourself, pal. We're just exploring, looking for survivors, that's all. We don't want any trouble. Survivors, eh? Exploring? Pretty well armed for explorers. What's in the bag? How about we put the guns down and we have a nice wee chat like grown-ups instead of this standoff? What do you say, eh? I say you tell me what's in the bag, and both my index fingers starts to get a bit twitchy. Nothing. Just tools. Nothing worth your time, friend. I will be the judge of that, friend. Now open it. I'm not going to do that. Open the fucking bag! No. Open the fucking bag, or your friend here will get a bullet in his fucking face. Okay. Okay. Relax. I'll open it. We've hit the jackpot here, boys. Medicine, food, ammo. That is not a good idea. If you need medicine, or if someone is hurt, I will give you my assistance. But you're not going to be taking our stuff. This is not how this is going to go. I don't think you're in much of a position to be making demands there, buddy. Hey, look, we really are just looking for survivors. And by the looks of things, you fellas could do with our help. Why don't you just lower the gun and we can have a nice wee chat, eh? <laughs> he thinks we need his help, boys. Step the fuck back before I put a bullet in your goddamn skull. What part of we're taking your shit do you not understand? Do you even know who we are? Our piss poor village people tribute band. I think you're missing a builder, a cop, a Native American. <laughs> Laugh it up, arsewipe. We are the fallen angels. God's warriors. And you have stumbled into our cave. Like a pathetic, injured lamb. Serving yourself up to our brothers and sisters on a fucking silver platter. Whoa. Hold on. Brothers and sisters? Are you wise? Our brothers and sisters. Mothers and fathers. They are hungry. And it's time to feast. He fired his pistol into the air and the sound of groaning and growling erupted into a cacophony of sounds, deafening the pair left in the shopping centre with a swarm of the undead creatures clawing at the air, slowly making their way up the metal stairs to the escalators leading to the top floor, to the pair, to their dinner. The Fallen, an Eerie Earth production. Written, directed and edited by Kieran Begg. Starring... Saxon Davids as Pete Kirkman Megan Chase as Danny Cunningham Rick Oldroyd as Abbott Jay Platt as Stevenson Andrew Lodge as Roach Charlotte North as Beth Harper and Jake Bamford as Judas Thank you very much for listening and be sure to follow us on all social media and head over to eerieearth.com for more information on The Fallen Thanks very much for listening